Welcome to Smart Energy, a podcast where we talk about electrification, home improvement, and clean energy. I'm your host, Andrew Zellner, Editor-in-Chief at OhmConnect. This week, I'm joined by Andrew Corre, Associate Product Manager at OhmConnect. OhmConnect is on a mission to rally people to change how and when they use electricity, unlocking clean, affordable, and reliable energy. You can learn more and get paid to conserve energy at OhmConnect.com. Thanks for joining me, Andrew. I did want to mention to our listeners that they might recognize you from our bi-weekly prize giveaway videos on, on social media. Uh, yep, that is, that is where you would find me <laughs> uh, every other Sunday night, hanging out on social media channels. So uh, right here, yeah. same background. So it probably looks familiar. Yeah. Coming to you live from the same studio. Um, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so this week, uh, I really wanted to talk about the inflation reduction act. Um, it, uh, it's celebrating its one year anniversary this month in August. Uh, and we've already seen a lot of the effect of it. I think specifically around, uh, especially encouraging more domestic manufacturing, um, but also things, you know, Rebates for electric vehicles, solar panel incentives, home battery incentives, updating, you know, uh, fossil gas burning appliances. Um, but I, I'm curious, uh, what are what are your thoughts on on the Inflation Reduction Act so far? Uh, my thoughts on the Inflation Reduction Act is, uh, if I'm being honest, I, I wish it was uh, when we're com- when we're talking about, um, I think, climate related um, solutions is uh, that it had slightly different name uh, <laughs> to really uh, encourage people to, to see uh, what it is. Not that it's not uh, accomplishing uh, some of that, mm-hmm. uh, but from a climate side of things, I think if uh, I don't want that, uh, those benefits to kind of slip through the cracks when people think about it. Uh, I really, I, I hope that people can, can see it for, uh, for what it is regarding this and that they can look into it and find all the benefits that are actually happening. Um, on the front end, mm-hmm. I, I think it has the potential to uh, dissuade people from uh, really looking into uh, the benefits that it has. Yeah. The name, <laughs> the name does feel very political. Like, you know, I think the benefit for a lot of consumers and for the country are around those uh, climate initiatives, cleaner energy stuff creating some some jobs in manufacturing um but it does feel like cloaked a little bit if you're not an engaged member of of uh of the government right now uh yeah yeah i i think that there's just there's a lot of good good deep meaningful content within mm-hmm. it and uh my uh my i think high level uh, concern is that it it can turn people off to uh, what's actually in it, and so. Um, but you know, we we get to do uh, things like this, like really dig into yeah. it. Um, so that's like my my <laughs> first initial feeling about uh, what it actually is. And some people might not be might think that it's gonna w- regarding the name, it's gonna have that effect immediately. And if they don't see it immediately, again, it's going to turn them off to it. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, we have to we have to let the let. Um, kind of time happen and we're a year into it. And so now uh, we get to talk about the benefits that it's already, that it's already uh, having and how it's shaping people's lives regarding uh, climate. Um, You know, I think the, the biggest thing that the act has done so far is kind of unlock a lot of investment, both on the public side, um, but then also on the private side, you know, I think incentivizing, private businesses to embrace climate technology, um, bring sort of more manufacturing back to the United States um, and, and create some jobs too, I think is, has been one of the biggest wins. Um, I know, so I'm in Minnesota and, you know, not necessarily a place, a uh, place people think of when they think of about climate technology. Um, but uh, they're building, I think what, at least one solar plant, uh, in Southern Minnesota. And then, um, there's a bunch of work underway to develop more solar farms and a little bit more wind power too. Um, and that, that feels like those things probably wouldn't have happened as quickly had there not been these incentives on both the public and and private side. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be curious to see how much more that happens. Like I, you know, I live in, um, uh, well, maybe you don't know, but 
for those who don't know, I live in central California and there's a lot of land out here. And mm-hmm. um, the, a lot of the land is still agriculture. Uh, every so often though, as you're driving, you'll see more kind of solar farms popping up and they're getting bigger and bigger. And um, I, I'm curious to see as those, uh, I'm curious to see more of those pop up as we talk a little bit more about electrification and the benefits uh, that it's happen- that it's having not only to just uh, society in general, um, but as we look a little bit more at um, how it's benefiting, um, ooh, I don't want to use the word just consumers, but how yeah. it's benefiting us from a, a consumeristic standpoint, the things that we're going to uh, be able to go out and um, put in our homes or put on our homes or uh, how it becomes a little more feasible for smaller single family homes to really participate in the larger um, idea and benefit of, of saving energy and, uh, and benefiting from it and uh, benefiting from um, contributing uh, to, to the, uh, to this idea of, you know, being better for our climate. Cause I think if I'm, also being honest, historically, there's been a lot of people that raise their hand and go, how, what am I supposed to do? How mm-hmm. am I supposed to, how am I just one single person supposed to contribute in a meaningful way? And so the, the act, as you called it, which I appreciate how you <laughs> shorten that a little bit. Um, what I think that that contributed to was opening the door for uh, people to step through and go, oh, there are things that I can do. And uh, we're, we're going to be, um, uh, maybe not subsidized, but we're going to, we're going to be encouraged to, uh, through the act, uh, mm-hmm. to make, to take those steps. And I think that that's huge moving forward. You know, one other thing I think a lot about is that folks who own homes, um, you know, they're not necessarily proactive about replacing things or even maintaining some things. Um, and one of the other, uh, things that's happening in our climate right now is that climates are changing. And I'm thinking specifically about like, uh, the Northwest, um, Seattle and Portland had a couple of, you know, big heat dome events in places where folks traditionally haven't even had air conditioning. Uh, and so also, you know, giving folks incentives to, um, make those updates to their homes that need to happen because climate is changing. Um, but like making sure they do them in a way that like has the least climate impact, uh, I think is, is another yeah. interesting part of this. Yeah. I think it'll be, it'll be, I'm curious to see how also, I think when we think about new infrastructure and new be a construction in, in, in parts of the country like that, that historically have not, you know, they've had, uh, more temperate, cooler mm-hmm. climates. And so they haven't had the need for someone like me who, again, lives in Central Valley where it can get, easily get over 100 degrees for multiple months on end in the middle of the summer. Um, there's obviously an air conditioner in my house. Yeah. And so it'll be, I'll be curious to see how this actually contributes to not only uh, helping people update the infrastructure of their own home, but really how it actually like updates the infrastructure of new new stuff coming to cities like that, like you said, in the Northwest. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it's, it's more attainable. It feels more attainable. It feels like it's doable. Uh, I think for homeowners who are looking at their home and maybe they're feeling like they can manage the heat for a little bit, but do they really want to drop however much money it costs to, to update the infrastructure of their home? And then we have something like, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that's coming in going, well, let us help. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see what we can do uh, together in order to uh, make it a little bit more attainable. So I think that's a big deal. Uh, so <clears throat> as a homeowner, have you like thought at all about what 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 you might want to do to your own home, um, you know, with the incentives from the Inflation Reduction Act out there? Um. You know, I, I am fortunate to live in a newer home. And so uh, a lot of everything that's in my house is is relatively brand new, at least within six, mm-hmm. seven years. And so for me, as I think about um, the stuff in my home, as it stands, I don't put myself, I don't 
put myself in the position to think about how uh, the benefits would help me. That being said, um, my parents, for instance, their house is 40 years old. And uh, we actually just got solar put on their house uh, earlier this year. And I am constantly looking at the 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 stuff in their home that's still there from when I was growing up there and uh and I'm having good conversations with them about about what uh the inflation reduction act can actually help for them they have an older water heater for instance big old tank water heater um their uh their HVAC unit on top of their house uh is um is old. It's been there for a number of years. I think I was still living there when they, I think, had it replaced, which at that point, maybe it's been like 20 years. And so <laughs> I am having good conversations with them uh, about how they can take advantage of or continue to take advantage of what uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is offering. Um, for me, though, like I said, um, when things are working and running, uh, and I, I fall into the category of it's running fine. Like, why would I need to replace it? I don't know if I, even though I'm going to get an incentive or help maybe with the cost of something, uh, the best way I think to save money is to not spend it at all. (laughs) And so, uh, I do, I do get to have those conversations, uh, with my wife about, you know, how, how far we want to go in order to, um, also help our home become energy efficient. Uh, that being said, it being new, you know, we have solar on our home. It's been amazing. Uh, it, we've had it for a little over a year. Um, and we continue to take steps as uh, being a part of Ohm Connect. Um, one of the best things I think we can do, uh, and it's free, you know, I'll just put a little plug yeah. there, uh, to adjust our behaviors and uh, to respond when uh, the grid needs it. So uh, for my home, I haven't thought a lot about it. But for other people around me, people who have older homes, um, it's good because they're coming to me asking questions about it, and I'm able to kind of point them in the right direction. So I'm, I would say I'm on the complete other side of uh, home ownership. My house was built in 1906, so we're coming up on 120 years awesome. here pretty soon. <laughs> um, you know, our uh, our furnace is probably, it, it's not 1906, but it's probably like 1930s, 1940s. It's a gravity furnace. <laughs> Might as well be 1906. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. and it, you know, it's 30% efficient. Um, and like, basically we're just, every winter just feels like we're burning money and sending it up the chimney. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so I, for me specifically, um, the incentives around uh, heat pumps uh, for heating and cooling um, and also for water heating and actually uh, clothes drying are kind of where where the act has really, uh, really started to speak to me. Um, I've, I said this actually on the last podcast, but I have a gas powered clothes dryer and I just, it, you know, it has no electric, like very little electric load. Um, and gas is still cheap here, but I also, it also means I have to have a four inch hole in the side of my house to exhaust, um, you know, the, uh, the warm air from the dryer, but also that's used to exhaust any like, non-combusted gas um and it just feels it feels crazy <laughs> like a gas like a yeah. gas dryer is like the exact wrong way to use gas if there is a if there ever was was a right one mm. um and similarly uh you know we replaced our gas water heater with a heat pump water heater uh which spoiler alert we're going to be talking about uh, in our reader question um and then uh also because this house was built in 1906 um, the sort of status quo at that time was build a house that like leaks a lot of air so things can dry out. Um, and today that equates to it leaks a lot of money from conditioning that air. Uh, and there are like other <laughs> approaches uh, to how you should uh, weatherize your home. Um, and so the Inflation Reduction Act also has uh, money set aside for uh, insulation and air sealing uh, of houses, which is something I think even many new houses could benefit from, for more of too. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, for everyone, you know, I feel, again, I feel very fortunate to have a newer home. I didn't think that that was going to be, uh, our story to be able to have, and it just ended up working out that way. Um, and you know, I think that that's probably fewer and further between though. I think that uh, the greater majority of people are living in either, um, you know, apartments or homes that, that need those, that, those weatherizing mm-hmm. 
upgrades. And uh, like I said before, it always just kind of feels, I would imagine, I guess I should say, it feels unattainable. It feels like, you know, people would, might rather just pay their energy bill um, <laughs> instead of go through the process of letting the person in their house who's knocking on the door going, hey, can I help you with weatherizing your windows? And it's like, oh, no, thanks. No solicitors. Uh, uh, but really now it's been kind of placed in our laps, so to speak, of going, here's all the things, it's laid out all the things that you can do. Mm -hmm. And it's also laid out all the things that we are willing to help you do that you can do. And I think that, again, that's a big deal. And I hope people can look past the um, politicization of, of what it is and look into, especially from a climate standpoint, all the benefits that are there. Because it's huge. I mean, there's a lot, there was a lot of resources allocated to this. And it's not just it's not just to put everyone in an electric vehicle. Yeah. Uh, that is not, that's not the, I think that uh, I don't, at this point, that's not the way forward. The way forward is uh, in the everyday uh, mundane way of life, like cooking on a stove to drying your, to drying your clothes, to heating your heating and cooling your home. Uh, those are the things that people are, are really going to benefit from in the more short term. Uh, and so as we think about electrification, uh, our guest this week is Sean Armstrong of Redwood Energy. Uh, he and I had a, a fascinating discussion about electrification. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, gas stoves uh, and induction cooktops. Uh, and then also sort of like the, 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 the common excuses people give for needing gas in their homes and like why that's really not the case anymore. Uh, so, uh, Andrew, I'll check back with you after that interview. So our guest uh, today is Sean Armstrong of Redwood Energy. Sean, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, so if you could tell me a little bit about uh, what uh, what you do and what Redwood Energy is. Sure. Okay. So. Um, we are a vanguard energy modeling organization. Uh, back in 2011, we were pretty isolated as people who were only designing all electric housing using heat pumps, which was a pretty innovative at the time, including heat pump water heaters, and focusing on affordable housing. There were a lot of different financial incentives that overlapped in affordable housing to encourage electrification and to encourage rooftop solar. So kind of hung out in this little niche business area, affordable housing that's zero net energy. And it's grown as the movement's grown and people have realized that you know, heat pumps dramatically reduce total amounts of fossil fuel used in the grid and they can lower utility bills in about 80% of the United States. And they always lower utility bills if you have a rooftop solar array on, even in California or Florida, which have the highest electricity rates in the country. Um, so... Starting as an affordable housing consultancy and moving into new product research and trying to help out in developing new policies. And so, for instance, we hired the lawyers to write the legal opinion that Berkeley eventually adopted to ban gas in Berkeley. And then we provided technical mm -hmm. support for about 80 other cities in, in California to help them also ban gas in new construction or discourage it heavily. So we have another role in providing technical guidance to municipalities and organizations. That's kind of all grown out of our affordable housing. So having a good time. It's, it's great. Like it used to be, a, I am a nerd, but it used to be like I was a nerd within a bunch of nerds. It's like I was into electrification and everyone else was into gas at the building science conferences. And now it's more like mm -hmm. I get to dance at the party. Yay. You know, the cute girl wants to dance <laughs> with me too. And, and it's, it's a great experience to have grown out of being shunned <laughs> to being celebrated. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing how much that has shifted in, in the last 10 years. Um, yeah. you know, it, it uh, really starts and, in 2019. Now, I'll just say like, if you put a mm -hmm. pin on it in 2017 is when pg &E first starts rebating all electric construction. They refused to give money, no matter how efficient your building was to all electric construction. That was true throughout California. So 2017 is when. Mm -hmm something changes and then 2019 is when Berkeley bans gas and everything starts to change. Um, so I'd say it's not even the last 10 years. I'd say it's like the last four or five. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then uh, especially since the uh, passage of the inflation reduction act, you know, yeah. like, 
heat pumps are being talked about everywhere. Electrification yeah. is being talked about everywhere. Um, you know, as sort of one of the early proponents of that, I'm I'm curious, um, sort of what what you what you see as the like short term impediments to more electrification. I think that they're mostly in people's heads. So there there is a strong predominant misunderstanding that people need to upsize their electrical service. And that is really expensive and really time intensive. We did a study for pg and &E, we found that it was at least $3,000 to get a new electrical line delivered to your house. And could be up to like eighteen dollars to $30,000, depending on if you're trying to underground it or you had to participate in purchasing a portion of a transformer, let alone buying an actual new transformer for your neighborhood. I have a client who's... <laughs> Just trying to electrify their house, but they're being told by PG&E that you have to get a new bucket transformer for everybody if you do it. <laughs> so that kind of, of hassle is something I focus hard on on how to do fast and, and, and inexpensive electrification retrofits as opposed to the slow and costly way. That um, So I, I do see I have a role in trying to educate people because it's not like we can't do this fast and easy. It's just that people don't know how enough. It's just not the way people are thinking. So if anything, that's kind of neat. It's easy to change people's minds. It's not so easy to start new factories. So I'd say that, like, just <laughs> and, getting and so I'm, I'm go at it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so when you say uh, folks don't need to increase the size of their electric panels um, or their service, um, what, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well... When you're looking at a house, it usually has a 100 amp service, which is a certain thickness of copper line from the power pole to your house. That's your service line. And it can handle 100 mm -hmm. amps of electricity. More than that, it would get too hot and it'd cause a fire. So people have been told that they need to go from a 100 amp panel to a 200 amp panel and service like a new copper line from the street in order to handle the amount of electricity. We've done a lot of research and found that people actually use about 35 amps of their 100. So they have a lot of room to electrify things in their home before they got to 100 amps. That is the, the challenge of showing people the different strategies they can have to just quickly electrify their home. So that might mean that you're a water heater. You could get a water heater that uses 30 amps, like almost all that you would normally use. It would just use when it was turned on. That's a lot, and that prevents people mm -hmm. frequently from electrifying their house is a 30 amp draw from their water heater. But they make ones now that instead of using 30 amps, they use the equivalent of like six amps. And instead of having a big hot toaster wire in there to heat up the water heater, Instead, it's using uh, storage strategies. It stores the water at 140 Fahrenheit, not at 125. That difference of 15 degrees Fahrenheit is equivalent to having put in a 30 amp electric toaster element in there. That's, those things provide the same amount of hot water service. Uh, water that's stored at a hotter temperature or a big electrical service backup. And so we've been focusing on showing people, you can just plug in this same water heater, gives you the same service, same number of showers, et cetera. It just uses a storage strategy, like almost like a battery, but it's just hot water. So it's cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hot water is really cheap. <laughs> and uh, so that would be a good example is using these, I call them retrofit ready. You can just plug it in anywhere. It's a 120 volt water heater. It uses so little electricity that any electrical circuit in your house can can plug right in. It doesn't need anything fancy or special. Just plug it in, walk away. And that's new. Those products have only been out for about a year and a half, but I spent seven years or so working with the manufacturers to try to get them to develop them, pestering them at building science conferences, testing it out, piloting it, all the things that you do to, to get it market ready. So that's the kind of thing that, that we do is <clears throat> see a problem, find a solution that doesn't require a service upgrade or rewiring. Because <laughs> I just know that's, that is the hard thing, is people getting an electrician to their house and working with the local utility. If we can avoid that, most of these things are easy. Uh, so the other 
uh, thing on folks' minds in the electrification conversation are switching from maybe their air conditioner to a heat pump or their forced air furnace yeah. and an AC to a heat pump. Um, yeah. You know, can, can you talk through a little bit like what a, what a homeowner should be considering or thinking about and maybe what are some common pain points? Sure. Okay. So let's say the easiest scenario would be is that you've got a ducted heat pump or ducted furnace and maybe an air conditioner too that's mm -hmm. using the same duct work. So easy. That means you go out to where the air conditioner is, that big square block with a fan inside of it, and you put in a new one that looks the same, maybe by the same manufacturer because air conditioners are heat pumps. And all you have to do to make it so that an air conditioner will also heat is put in a reversing valve and a reversing pump, essentially, and some computer controls. But it's like $200 worth mm -hmm. of stuff that takes an air conditioner and turns it into a heater. So it's cheap and easy, basically. So you stick your, your now your heat pump where your air conditioner was, and you use all the same infrastructure, the same ductwork, et cetera, and you just put a box where the air conditioner box was up in the ductwork, and now it's a heat pump box. Yay! So easy. <laughs> now, let's say that you don't even like your ductwork. Like, I've never made this room very warm anyway. Well, then you could adopt how the rest of the world heats and cools their, their homes, which is with duckless mini splits, where you have a that, that box on the outside, call it a compressor, call it a condenser, call it whatever you want, that heat pump box on the outside. Instead of it running a copper line of hot refrigerant up to a big fan coil box in your ductwork, instead of that, it now runs little copper lines to little fan coils on the wall. And people in the whole world do this. If you travel, you'll see these white plastic boxes that are the air conditioner and heater that are on the wall. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit cheaper and easier, usually, than installing the ductwork. Not always. It's kind of break even, so it really depends. But it's so nice, because then you have a remote control to control the heating and cooling in every room. It's like luxury, really, and not more expensive. Then, Let's say that you had a small house. I live in a tiny house. This is 100 square feet that I'm living in right now. This is sort of part of my divorce deal with my ex, so that I live here, I get to be next to my kids, and we all sort of share this little family compound. So small homes, you can start getting into these tiny window heat pumps that are out there, and tiny portable heat pumps. Mm -hmm. So I've been showing, like a lot of my, my staff now have a portable heat pump. It rolls around and it cl plugs into your window and it both heats and cools. I learned that from a guy named Nate the House Whisperer in Ohio. He's been using these portable heat pumps to heat and cool his house um, with a little electric resistance like heaters to back it up in the wintertime because the ones that are out there right now don't do great below freezing. <clears throat> so he's he found like a modest climate and he's using these crazy cheap, like $700 portable heat pumps to heat his house. And, and so with smaller houses, you can use smaller pre-manufactured do-it-yourself heat pumps that um, can you know lower the cost by 90%, like an order of magnitude <laughs> less expensive if you get something that's factory finished and do-it-yourself versus mm -hmm. assembled on site by a pro professional contractor. So that on the heating and cooling, I try to show people that you have options. Keep your duct work. Just put something in. Don't keep your duct work. Put in ductless mini splits. Uh, don't do either of those things. Just heat and cool a room with a, a portable or a window heat pump and, and save a bunch of money. Um, so there's like three basic options for HVAC. You ask for pain point. <clears throat> the pain point is radiators. When gas boilers produce 180 degree Fahrenheit water for these incredibly inefficient, huge, old, metal clunky radiators, these are inefficient, meaning like they do a terrible job of distributing heat, which is why it has to be so hot to get any work done. Mm -hmm. And then you have something like burns you if you touch it. I grew up with radiators in Wisconsin, right? They're, they're dangerous yeah. if you actually touch one. <clears throat> Give you a good burn. <laughs> so... Those, you can replace the gas boiler with a carbon dioxide refrigerant heat pump boiler. They go to 180 Fahrenheit, but they're kind of rare. And they make them. Okay. Uh, there's a great product called, uh, oh, it's, dang it, I'm losing its name. It's uh, uh, Watt, Link by Watts, L-Y-N-C, the Link product by this company called Watts. 
They're in upstate New York. They make a beautiful, big CO2 boiler. Other than that, though, most heat pumps don't produce water hotter than 130 degrees, maybe 140 degrees, mm-hmm. because the refrigerant 410A doesn't go hotter than that. So that's a pain point. You have radiators, you have a gas boiler, but you don't have a, a, a very easy heat pump replacement. So <clears throat> you can put in new radiators, efficient radiators, and those ones will produce like hot air, even though the water itself is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you can get a room that's 80 degrees Fahrenheit out of 80 degrees Fahrenheit water because the radiators themselves are really efficient at doing their job. They might even have a fan in them if you want it to also do air conditioning because cold air doesn't rise. So if you are using a radiator also for air conditioning, you really need a fan on it to to push the cold air into your room. But that pain point of like, ah, I need 180 degrees Fahrenheit water, you solve by saying, I don't need 180 degrees Fahrenheit water. I need 130 degrees my new radiators will use far less energy, like they'll be an energy efficiency metric, and they're going to be compatible with the heat pumps that are on the market now. So that's a little trickier. People don't necessarily want to replace their radiators, but that is one of the most practical solutions. And other way to abandon the radiators is to put in one of those window heat pumps or portable heat pumps, because you don't need the radiator, you just need heat. <laughs> so mm-hmm. if the radiator is the problem, just, you know, either get rid of it or leave it there and put in something better around it. I, I for instance, have an old gas space heating system still installed in our house. I don't have gas to my house. It's just what a pain in the butt to take out this big gas wall heater. <laughs> so I just put like jackets over it and ignore it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a family man. I don't have money for crazy things like that. So Okay, so that's your answer to the question. There's there's some options depending upon your situation. So uh, let's say that somebody isn't ready to make the switch to a heat pump. You know, what are some other things they should be thinking about to, you know, save some money or make their house more comfortable, oh, perform better? Number one is get rid of your gas stove. Holy moly. So I I sent one of my staff an infrared camera because I'm trying to document how much smoke is coming off these that people can't see. So Mm -hmm. it is more than and dirtier than than the smoke that comes from your car exhaust when you're idling. So when your gas stove is going, you are doing more, worse things to your health than if you put the exhaust of your car straight into the kitchen, like put a hose into the window. The stove is a dirtier burn because there's catalytic converters in vehicles and they're burning more gas compared to idling when you're cooking on a stove. And that is why gas stoves are the equivalent of someone smoking cigarettes in your living room all day long. There was a great study back in 1995. You know, I'm old enough to remember when there was a cigarette smoking part of the airplane and the cigarette smoking part of the restaurants. Right. Yeah. So in 1995, there's still lots of people smoking in their homes. So they did a big study with 600 people showing, splitting it up into two, 300 groups, saying, if you have a smoker in the house, but you're cooking on electric, that has the same health impacts of heart attacks, the need to use like lung disease medications, developing asthma, having chest pains. You didn't have a heart attack, but you had, a, you had an experience there. All that is the same. Is if you had a gas stove, the person who's cooking on the gas stove versus a person who's cooking on an electric stove with a cigarette smoker who lives in the house and smokes in the living room. That's how dirty your gas stove is. And I don't know anyone these days who invites someone over into their house and says, here's a cigarette, here's an ashtray, (laughs) sit in my living room all day and chain smoke. That's crazy talk, right, in the modern world. And everyone's like, but a gas stove. Hence why I got an infrared camera and I have videos showing it looks like a bonfire of smoke. It's like those things like you'd be like, white rabbit, white rabbit, you know, if you had that much smoke (laughs) in your face around a campfire. That's the amount of smoke Mm -hmm. that's coming off of a gas stove. It looks just like bonfire smoke. It's dirty. It's the number one source of of formaldehyde in your life. That stuff that like pickles rats for 200 years because it's so poisonous. It's directly a cancer causer. And it comes flowing off of stoves because most pollutants on stoves are heavier than air. So they accumulate Mm -hmm. where pets are and babies are which are usually around your feet. Like I have three kids and my kids always hung around me until they're about five while I was cooking. And then they'd wander off in the house after that. But I had kids around me, like in the kitchen, wanting to be close to me. 
terribly poisonous for them. They're closer to the ground. They breathe a lot more than adults do compared to their body weight. They're growing and they're, mm -hmm. they're vulnerable. Their immune systems aren't fully developed. So when you're poisoning them with a cancer-causing chemical like formaldehyde, you are doing harm. That is a cause of 1 in 8, 12% of American children who got asthma got it just from their gas stove. So it's one in eight kids with asthma. It's just the gas stove that caused it. And that's been proven in Australia. It's been proven in the United States. It's been proven over in Great Britain. Like scientists, the planet wide, deal with gas stove pollution. And we've known it since the 1970s in the United States. The American Gas Association started publishing on it in 1971. The 50 years of us knowing that it's just like asthma. And people are finally starting to engage this issue. So I encourage people, if you've got a gas stove, to go buy. Uh, my favorite is Chef Top True Induction. It's 130 bucks on, on Amazon. There's a lot of other ones, New Wave, and a whole bunch. But I like mm -hmm. the Chef Top. It's 130 bucks, and it has all the right controls that you want on it, and it's quiet. The buttons don't make sounds. It doesn't like beep loudly at you and such. And uh, so I give them away to people as like Christmas gifts. Here's your $130 two-burner induction stove. You can plug it into any plug in your kitchen. And I cook all my food um, over here. This is my two-burner induction range I'm gesturing at. You can see. Mm -hmm. Just making some food here is my cast iron pan. So if you can, you can immediately plug in an induction stove and no longer have this massive exposure to gas, which is what I did when my mother-in-law died in the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa in 2017. It's very topical right now with the Lahaina fire, uh, which is mm -hmm. making me emotional just thinking about it because, you know, there, there are dozens of people that died in the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa. There were more than 80 people that died the next year in the Paradise fire. This is all climate change induced. And when you are looking at a flame from your stove and being like, <laughs> you can't deny, like, that's me. I'm burning gas. And it's super bad for me. And, and I was just freaking out. I was like, I just can't. I ha we have to like, we just, we have to stop all of this. This is, Nan just died. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Mother-in-law, grandma died. <laughs> so that means we change things now. And we, every year we keep on getting reminded that people are dying horrible deaths, like terrifying, horrible deaths and losing their town because of climate change. So I'd say like, start with the stove. It's 130 bucks. You'll never regret it. It's a better cooking experience. It boils water faster. It's easier to cook at low temperatures. You don't ever burn yourself on it. It doesn't produce any smoke. Like do that first. Don't spend fifteen thousand dollars on your HVAC system. As important as that is, go for your own personal health and and just have a nicer, better cooking experience with your 130 buck two burner induction range off of Amazon or wherever you know Lowe's, Home Depot. I'm not trying to be particular. <laughs> That'd be what I'd say. Go for the stove. Um, that I, that's that's so interesting. I, I so my sister and brother in law live in northern Wisconsin, um, and they didn't have a gas stove. They had an electric stove, but their the performance of it wasn't great. Um, oh, they suck. And electric resistance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like induction. Uh, it was better than gas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they they did a similar thing. They bought a single burner induction stove. I think from Costco it was like sixty bucks, and they yeah. used it. Uh, you know, tried out all their pans. There were a couple that didn't work, but like, who cares? Yeah. And then they they made the switch, and it, it's it's incredible. Like how like specifically boiling water on an induction stove is just like it's like a magic trick almost. It's it, crazy. You, you can't walk away from your stove. Like when you're cooking on gas, yeah. you have to like, you turn it on full blast, and you can walk around and do some things in your room. With the induction, mm -hmm. since it's two or three times faster, I mean, like, you turn it on and it's it's bubbling there in a minute. You're just like, you've just barely got the noodles open to dump in and the water's already boiling. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, it's yeah. great. Um, so, you know, I, I think the other really interesting thing about you and your business is the fact that you're focused so much on affordable housing. Yeah. Um, it sort of feels like in, especially in the United States, folks who are building new houses aren't the ones who need to worry about, uh, you know, affording their house as much as, as a lot of the, the country does. Um, and at the same time, you know, we, we know folks biggest bills every month outside of their rent or their mortgage are their energy bills. 
Um, yeah. And I, I, th I think, you know, I think when people hear all electric and affordable housing, they don't necessarily think of them as going together. One of them seems expensive and, but, but like, obviously yeah. you've made it work and, and I'm curious sort of what the, I, let what, me tell what you the math or like the, yeah. You know, I look to the American South. The American South has gone all electric because it's cheaper to build. Now, 95% of homes in the United States are built by a developer or a factory. Only 5% are wealthy people who are building custom homes for themselves or people who are so enter enterprising that they actually build their own house. That's mm -hmm. very rare. So all of us are dealing with the business choices of someone else who's trying to sell us something that, that a low cost, but a profitable low cost. So once you've established that everyone is living in a house that someone else developed, then you get to say like, well, what were the choices that the developer made and why? And you discovered that like Florida is 77% all electric construction. Florida, Hawaii is 72% all electric construction. Every state around us, like I'm in California right now, California is only 8% because our policies have been aggressively against all electric construction. California is a petro state. You forget that this is a, a petroleum producing state. And we made mistakes. We just straight up made a mistake in the 1970s. Our response to the oil embargo in California was to push for gas. In the rest of the United mm -hmm. States, they said, oh, well, that means that we have cheap electricity. We're going to go all electric. We're just not even going to use gas. So California, tragically, is one of the least electrified states. And it's just a stupid mistake. They're so parochial. Like, I'll go argue with the regulators. I mean, look. Look what Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Texas, Arizona, everyone around us has the same climate. They have similar energy prices, and they've all been building all electric because they deal with the federal code, and only California has a state code that they can just crank down and you make you do things. And we were making right. people do the wrong thing. We were making our buildings more expensive to build because all electric is less expensive to build. If you look at it, stoves. Gas stove is always $100 more than the electric stove, the exact same manufacturer brand, etc. Look at the space heating system and the cooling system. If you get a heat pump, which means it does air conditioning, and space heating does both, right? That's $2,000. If you get the same air conditioner and a gas furnace, so it does heating and cooling, federal minimum efficiency, nothing fancy, it's $3,000. And that difference in purchase cost gets magnified with the contractor's markup. And it's harder to install two different energy systems like gas and electricity to one device. Just run the electricity. Mm -hmm. At every step, it's less expensive to build and develop all electric. From the purchases of the appliances to the delivery of gas to the building to the venting of the gas pollution out of the building. And it's also more dangerous to install gas. And so like in Sun Valley, uh, with Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, right? Our mm -hmm. home state, you and I. Yep. Terrific example, there was a contractor out there and he blew himself up. He, he hit a gas line while he was building in a building. And not only did he die and blow the building up, but also damaged nearby buildings and scared the piss out of everybody. And that happens all over the country. People blowing themselves up with gas. Turn on a, mm -hmm. it's like my sister and brother's apartment complex was rendered uninhabitable because someone on the third floor had a gas leak. And when they, when they, op they lit their stove, they turn on the stove and the turning on the stove blew up the whole apartment. And then the entire building got water damage as well as the person dying. You know, mm -hmm. that that's crazy. We don't have to, we don't have to do that. The gas is explosive and dangerous and more expensive to put in buildings. And every appliance that uses gas is more expensive than its electric equivalent. So whatever sort of popular conception there is around all electric being more expensive is, is denied and proven wrong by the developer choices of most of our nation. <laughs> and, and really, it would have been in the north also. We just didn't have cold climate heat pumps until about 15 years ago. That's the first time where we got mm -hmm. small computers put into heat pumps with the advent of small computers generally in the, in the early 2000s. When they added small computers to heat pumps, that allowed them to go below freezing down to negative 30 Fahrenheit. It was all about the computer running it in a different uh, way, as opposed to like, the old fashioned heat pumps, they're a single speed. Like when you're riding a bicycle and you have only one gear and you, and if you, that's, that's what old fashioned heat pumps, one gear. <laughs> and today's heat pumps are like something you take on the tour de France, 
36 gears, 100 gears. You can go up a crazy steep hill, which is the equivalent of a cold day. You can coast easy when it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You can, the computer makes the, the system work in all sorts of different climates and usually about 40% less energy total being used. So it's a dramatic efficiency gain in the summer. It reduces peak loads on the grid, helps us avoid power outages. If we get heat pumps, we lower the summer peak on the grid by about 25%. I just saw field data on this, 700 homes in California. So it's about one-fourth less total energy being used with these nice cold climate heat pumps versus old-fashioned one-speed air conditioners. So heat pumps also provide a big solution for all of our blackouts in the summer. And people have been saying, like, well, what about the fact that they use electricity in the wintertime? Studied that, too. Turns out they use less electricity in the wintertime than they do in the summertime. So our grid, which is designed for peaks of consumption, you know, it has to be able to handle mm -hmm. the most of the most. Uh, the winter peak is smaller than the summer peak, and the smaller peak is summer than it's smaller than its current summer peak if we go to heat pumps. Like, we solve a lot of problems, and we don't actually create a new one. So that quick thinking there is like developers say it's cheaper and people who study the grid say it's a lot better for our grid. We should be doing this as fast as we can. Um, so, you know, you also mentioned uh, being, you know, lobbying or like help helping provide studies around gas consumption and, and how horrible it is. Um, yeah. So <clears> is, <throat> is it the entire state of California has banned gas and new construction, or is it still on a city by city basis? 80 cities have done it. And the okay. universities have all done it. All the universities now that's been 2019. No, no university buildings get built with gas and also the retrofits. And then the air resources board has been directed by the governor to phase out all gas consumption by 2035. And 2035 means that they've been issuing regulations on a nonstop basis this year. Like yesterday, they issued regulations saying that by 2027, everyone who's making tortillas, you know, tortilla chips, hot dogs, dried nuts, anything that they're making with food in California, which makes a lot of food, keep in mind, with that Central mm -hmm. Valley, you know, anything that's industrial level of manufacturing of food, they have to electrify its product, its, its equipment by 2027. So that our beer, for instance, will now be all electric beer. Um, that they are putting out regulations for water heaters. That's 2027. Space heating systems, no more sale of gas space heating systems in 2029, which is not the same as you having to replace it. Right. It's just when it breaks, you're going to call someone who's going to come over with the heat pump version of it. And you're not going to have the option of putting in the next gas version, which is good because it'll lower your utility bills. Mm -hmm. It'll make the environment cleaner. It'll, like, it'll do all sorts of good things. But yeah, the heavy hand of the law is slowly coming down on us because we have had horrific wildfires in California. And we're all really upset. <laughs> you know, if you've had someone die or if you know someone who's died in these wildfires, you are out of patience. And then that's where we are. It's like they provoked a political crisis of people saying enough, God damn it, enough. You know, people have died in horrible ways. There, there is no more excuses. And that sort of urgency and reality based urgency, we're not just joking around here, that has right. changed politics. And so, yeah, by 2035, we are looking at a carbon neutral economy that uses no more fossil fuels than is sequestered by our forests. Um, so, you know, California is one of the largest states in, in the country. Like, do you see the rest of the country adopting these standards? Yeah. One in eight Americans live in California. So <laughs> the standards that are being adopted in California are then being readopted by about 15 other states in the United States okay. slowly. So the vehicle standards, for instance, are the ones that most other states immediately jump on board. But how the politics worked is that when California firmly embraced electrification in 2019 with a city every two weeks announcing their gas ban, it was just nonstop for about two years mm -hmm. as, as progressive coastal cities said, no more. 
And by the way, that's also how the cigarette indoor cigarette ban started. It's in California, like Santa Monica and such, where they were the first places sure. in the country to say no more cigarettes in restaurants. So these same cities talking about it in the same way, like we did this for cigarettes about 25 years ago. We're ready. Um, they then influenced the Inflation Reduction Act dramatically. And the, the California politics then got written into the Inflation Reduction Act. And so things like the Energy Star program no longer certifying gas products as efficient. They're not on the mm -hmm. Energy Star list. That's a subtle policy, but kind of real, you know, versus all the money that's coming in that's just for all electric construction. You know, it, it's be it for like, there's about $14,000 per low income house that will go in to electrify it through the Inflation Reduction Act's um, HERA monies high efficiency electric home rebate monies. So the money that comes out of the Inflation Reduction Act is not for gas products, and that's a brand new thing. There's never been an efficiency law passed that didn't have money for both gas and electric, and the Inflation Reduction Act has firmly put its foot down and saying, we're going to fund domestic solar panels, we're going to heavily reduce the cost of solar panels, and we're going to incentivize all electric construction. So, yeah, I think that California... Their policies work for California, but they inspire other states. New York passed theirs afterwards, Colorado, mm -hmm. Washington State, state of Hawaii, the city of Honolulu, you know, Massachusetts. It's been rolling like this for, for state by state. So I see, well, and then there's other important things to think about is that even if it's not a policy, note that like in Norway, they said in 2025, we're not going to sell any more internal combustion engines. Last year, only 20% of cars sold in Norway were, were using gas. 80% were electric. And Hyundai, this year they announced they weren't even going to try to sell gas cars in Norway. And it's still 2023. And so I also see these future deadlines, like 2027 for water heaters, 2029 for furnaces. We are seeing, once people have market signals, they start... Uh, anticipating and moving faster. They don't want to be the last person with the junk in there. And so that if that's for EVs over in Norway, or for that matter in China, like they essentially they've adopted a, a ban on get sale of gas cars in some, like in the province that's around Beijing, you can't buy a gas car this year. Done. And it's amazing to see, I've seen videos that people show me of like the streets of Beijing. It's everything is electric. The scooters, the dump trucks, the cars that are like, everything you've never seen it yeah it blew my mind <laughs> it's like this is the future it's the future just you know over there it's gonna be like this here um you know california this year we were at 25 percent sales of, of electric vehicles we were only at three percent like four years ago we have exponential growth happening for electric mm -hmm. vehicle adoption in our country heat pump adoption in our country induction stove sales Exponential meaning like 50% growth every year, not like 3% or 5%, not right. like this little flat line. It's like, no, no, this is the hockey stick. It's hockey stick, yeah. Hockey stick growth. So I think that California's policies that are and will continue to shape the rest of the country. But I also want to acknowledge like New York is doing amazing things. You know, Massachusetts, bravo. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like it's only California. Some of them have better policies than California has. And so it's one of those cute little competitions of like environmentalist nerds wanting to <laughs> one up each other if they can. <laughs> um, so, you know, all, we also know that uh, pur purchasing a house is becoming increasingly unaffordable for a variety of reasons. And a lot of folks are going to be renting for a long time or the rest of their lives. Mm. Um you know, what, what advice would you have for somebody who's, who's renting and sees high utility bills and wants to do something? Okay. Well, the most significant way you can lower utility bills is with a solar array, more than any efficiency strategy. So if you have a, a path to plugging in your solar array, do it. And in, in California, there are multifamily like apartment complex programs that solarize, like SOMA, Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing. And so tenants get a, di divid, like a divi dividend of the solar array that's up on the roof on their bills. That's the mm -hmm. most common thing I do every day is to, to solarize apartments. But if you're just one person inside an apartment complex as opposed to the owner that's doing it from top down, 
you can get some small solar arrays that go out on your patio. Um, that's for lowering bills. If you are if you are trying to make any significant change in utility bills, it's not going to necessarily come from gas or electricity. I just sorry to say, you you mm -hmm. will in about eighty percent of the country have somewhat lower utility bills if you do electric dryers or electric stoves, etc., electric water heating. Most of the country will lower your bills a little bit. Um, but just don't expect things to change dramatically. I would set instead point to people's stoves or gas stoves and just say, like, dude, I mean, stop smoking cigarettes in your house. Just start there. And, <laughs> and it's not a cost savings unless you figure, like, how dangerous and how expensive it is to have premature cancer in your life. Or, like, how fun is it to have an right. asthma little inhaler that you got to always pop in your mouth every time you take a jog outside. Like, think about your quality of life as, as worth money. And go for that stove. Yeah, no, that, that's a, a great, great point. The, I mean, especially uh, during the height of the pandemic, um, COVID, like the focus on indoor air quality conversation, I think was really, really interesting. And um, yeah, it, it's like, it's crazy that we're, it's crazy that we're burning fossil fuel inside our homes, you know, in the same spaces we're, we're living. Um, when you, when you put it in those, those like every, like nobody smokes in their houses anymore. Right. Like it's, right. it's absolutely and, nuts. And can you imagine one of the kids coming in with like a little bowl of gasoline and just lighting it on fire in the kitchen? Like everyone would freak out. You, <laughs> you don't get to light gasoline in the fridge. Like wh why are you burning gas? It is the same gas on your stove and thinking that's just fine. I think I'll even lean over it. It's the problem with gas off stoves is that you can't smell it and you can smell car exhaust. And right. so people just don't realize that it is the exact same thing, only a little bit dirtier off your stove than it is off the car, a little bit more polluting and dangerous for your health. Yep. Well, uh, on that note, uh, is, is there anything else, uh, you'd, you'd like to impart your wisdom? Uh, on our on our audience thanks for asking um yeah i think that people should acknowledge that it's going to be happening faster than they think it is uh, it is surprising to me how fast it's going and i'm a person who says it's going to go fast but i read mm -hmm. newspaper articles every day because i read about five papers a day around the world trying to track what people are doing and there's exponential growth curves of vehicles heat pump sales <clears throat> every single one of these things where I expect that we'll have electrified most things within the next 10 years in the United States. And so just get on board. Mm -hmm. like this, is, this is a fast ride. And, and it's taken 13 years for almost every exponential growth curve, be it cell phone adoption, home TVs, having a dryer in your house. Every single technology in the United States for the last 100 years has taken 13 years on average, 10 to 15 total, if an exponential gro growth curve starts. And it started started like a couple of years ago. So uh, buckle up. Things are going fast now, as they should. <laughs> great. Well, uh, Sean, it was so so great getting to talk with you again. Uh, Sean Armstrong of uh, Redwood Energy. If folks want to find out more about your work or what you do, uh, where should they go? <clears throat> we have a lot of booklets that are free at redwoodenergy.net. So if you want guidance on how to electrify your house or your apartment building or your commercial building, these are um, I try to write them so they're like People Magazine. Like, it's so easy to read with lots of pretty pictures that they put them out in dentist offices. So that's my goal, is to try to make them pretty and interesting and really tightly written so that it's not boring or extra technical. And then in the, the second half of these books are just big catalogs of the things that you might want. Like, here's all the different kinds of heat pumps for space heating. Here's the ones for water heating. So I'd say go to redwoodenergy.net and get a free download of, of like a book. A small book, like 30 pages to 130 pages, depending. But those are great resources to to dig into. They're, we try to make them so they're not painful to read. Each week, we take some time to answer questions from listeners. This week, we hear from Stephen, who wants to know when he should replace his water heater. Uh, and I, I'm assuming that Stephen wrote this to us because he's not uh, without a water heater right now. He's thinking a little bit proactively about it, maybe spurred on by some of the discussion he's heard from the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so, Andrew, I'm curious, uh, what, what's your experience with uh, with water heaters? 
Yeah, on uh, on my home, we have a tankless water heater. And uh, so I think uh, coming into a new home, again, six or seven years ago, uh, I looked at that and just thought that it was uh, an awesome um, space saver. Mm-hmm. Uh, small, it doesn't yeah. sit in a, uh, yeah, it doesn't sit in a giant closet or take up a bunch of room in my garage. It's just kind of like popped on the side of my house. And I remember looking at that and going, oh, that's that looks awesome. And uh, the more experience I've had with it, um, the less of a fan I am of a tankless water heater. Uh, I live, again, in the Central Valley. And one of the things that a lot of people care about around here is water. Mm-hmm. And so we, we think about water and we think about how we can not waste it. You know, we're on watering schedules and everyone wants their grass to be green. And I will turn on either a shower or a sink and I want the water to get hot. And it's just running and running and running and just flushing down. And I'm just sitting there under cold water waiting for the water to get hot. And initially, I'm just like, gosh, this can't be this can't be great. <laughs> and and then I think about, you know, there's also gas that's being used in this tankless water he- heater to heat that water that's coming through because it's it's just running through and it's trying to it's trying to heat it really fast and it feels like it's just a waste uh, because it's not heating it fast enough. And so um again, I my my perspective shifted. I looked at it and go, "Oh, it didn't take up a lot of space. Oh, it's nice. It's nice and and pretty on the side of my house and it's, you know, sitting there." And then over the last seven years, I, I got to say, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan, I'm not a huge fan of it. So that's <laughs> just seems like a waste all around. That, that's feedback. I've heard a lot about folks who have tankless water heaters, either gas or electric is that they, it, it feels like you're wasting water because you're waiting for it to heat up. Like when you turn on your hot water uh, faucet. Um, and so they tend to be a little less water efficient. They're still, you know, I'd say a gas tankless versus a gas tanked. The gas tankless is still more efficient with gas. Right. Um, right. It's only using it when it's on. Yeah. It's not just constantly <clears throat> he- keeping that pilot light running, constantly heating it. Yeah. Um, but in but in the tankless versus tank debate, um, I, you know, I'm a very, very strong advocate for a tanked water heater especially uh, if you can do something that's electric and uh, if you can do something that's heat, like you can get a heat pump water heater. Um, So Mm -hmm. historically uh, an electric tanked water heater uh, would heat water by turning electricity into heat through these uh, heating uh, coils, heating rods in your, your tank. Um, But a heat pump doesn't create heat. It actually just transfers it from one place to another. Uh, and so a heat pump water yeah. heater is like 30% more efficient than a standard electric tanked water heater. Um, one of the uh, things that folks don't necessarily think about when they're trying to go electric with their water heating is that an electric uh, tanked water heater, a standard resistance water heater, will require a pretty big uh, circuit for for that uh, water heater. Similarly, um, a lot of heat pump water he- water heaters out there right now have both a heat pump with an electric backup. So they also require a pretty big outlet. But uh, I think, and specifically in California, companies have started to develop heat pump water heaters that only need to plug into a standard 120 volt uh, outlet. Uh, And when you're thinking about swapping something that was previously gas powered um, or uh, like not having to run a new circuit for an appliance, I think is, is a huge money saver. Um, the only thing about that though, is that a 120 volt heat pump is only going to be heating water with a heat pump. So it doesn't have that electric resistance built in as like a backup in case for whatever reason, you're using a ton of water and it's very cold outside and it's not uh, catching up fast enough. Right, because because of the way that the heat pump works, yeah. right, transferring transferring uh, the uh, the heat kind of from one place to another, um, it would need to be in a you would need to strategically place it, especially if you're in a place that has colder yeah. cooler climates, right? You need to strategically place it where you're not just going to be trying to pool. <laughs> <laughs> There's no heat to transfer if it's just cold. Well, uh, so, so. Uh, theoretically, uh, there's always heat to be transferred. Um, sure. Unless sure, we're, sure, we're sure, talking sure. zero degrees Kelvin, which in which in which case probably not <laughs> <Right>. taking showers, <laughs> uh, washing clothes. 
Right. Um, but the other thing about heat heat pump water heaters, which uh, full disclosure, we've we've got one. Um, I installed it before the Inflation Reduction Act. Is that uh, they take longer to recover. So when you think about a water heater, mm -hmm. um, as you're using hot water, water from your well or your municipal supply is going back in and it's at a different temperature and needs to heat up. Um, and the recovery rate on heat pump water heaters is as longer than on a, a gas or an electric resistance tanked water heater. Um, and so instead of, you know, I think a standard for a gas water heater to sort of like reheat all of the water in its tank is about an hour. Um, it doesn't, you know, you don't empty it and then fill it and wait an hour. That's like not how it works. But if you were to do the math, it would take an hour to get all that water back up to temperature. Um, with a heat pump water heater, uh, using only the heat pump, you know, it's somewhere between like an hour and 15 minutes to like an hour and 45 minutes, depending on how big your tank is, what the temperature of your incoming water is, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, so like in Minnesota, where I live, the water is a lot colder during the winter. And so it takes longer for that water to get back up to the 120 degrees <laughs> I'd like it to be at when it's fully heated. Right. Um, the argument I know for tankless uh, water heaters like the one I have is, is once it's hot, it's hot. And if you have an unlimited supply of water, you'll have an unlimited <laughs> supply of hot water for as long as that water's running, which again, I can't condone. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of just wasting water just for the sake of it. Um, I do not take uh, long showers. <laughs> I'm, I'm in and out of there, mm -hmm. especially in the summertime because it's just hot anyway. Yeah. Um, and so I know that people will use that often of going, ah, uh, you know, maybe it takes a long time for it to heat up, but man, I have hot water until you know, forever. And so, um, I can understand, uh, I can understand the hesitancy when it comes to a heat pump. If, if it's taking a heat pump water heater, if it's taking a little bit longer to, um, to recover. So one of the, uh, simple fixes for that, um, is to increase the tank size of your heat pump water heater. Uh, sure. so when we replaced ours, we had a 50 gallon gas water heater, uh, and we went to an 80 gallon heat pump water heater. Um, and that provides plenty of water for, for everything, especially, you know, being used to that 50 gallon size. Um, so that, that's one thing I would always recommend when folks are switching to a heat pump is get the, the largest size you can afford and have space for, um, an 80 gallon tank is huge and there's a heat pump unit on top of it. So it's like almost the, the full height of our basement ceiling. Um, right. But you know, you were mentioning, a you were mentioning a little earlier about, um, you said kind of spoiler, we're going to talk yeah. about it. The Inflation Reduction Act, what is it uh, to help Stephen, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Uh, was that, what, what does that do for, you know, how does that help him if he's looking into a heat pump water heater? Uh, so uh, for a heat pump water heater, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, will give you up to $1,750 uh, for a heat pump water heater. I think uh, there are some specifications on what it's replacing um, and like uh, who's installing it, all that sort of stuff. Um, but if that's huge, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, I think I paid $2,400 for ours. Um, and, and that's also, that's like three times the cost of an electric tank or a gas tanked water heater. Um, right. But I've felt really good about getting that natural gas usage out of our home. Um, and, you know, it's it also most heat pump uh, water heaters uh, have some smart features to them. So, you know, I'm not on uh, time of use pricing right now for my electricity. I actually will be very soon um, because we did purchase an EV. We'll talk about that in a different show. Um, <laughs> but when we move into that time of use, uh, pricing, I can set my heat pump water heater to, you know, only heat to the certain temperature during off periods, um, you know, be okay with it sort of drifting a little bit, uh, when prices spike, um, and like being able to sort of program that stuff. So I don't need to actively think about it, you know, like nobody's going to run downstairs and like turn off their water heater when electricity prices are spiking sure. or any of that kind of stuff. But having that smart technology built in, I think is really cool. So Steven, I would encourage you to research heat pump water heaters. 
Um, don't be too concerned about what sort of electricity or circuits you have uh, available. You can get get ones that plug into a standard household circuit. Um, and and yeah, like it's not just about heating water. It's also about using water. Uh, but being strategic about how you heat your water can also pay off uh, big in the long term in terms of your utility bills. Uh, because in most homes, water heating is the second or third largest source of energy usage. Um, and that, that can have a huge effect. Uh, Andrew, any other thoughts on water heaters for Steven? No thoughts for me. I think we covered it all. I, I hope that, I hope that's is, this is good information for you to consider. I hope that it answered your question, Steven. And, uh, also that you, if you can look in a little bit more into the inflation reduction act to really see how it can benefit you, if you uh, do decide to, um, take that step toward that. Uh, one, one thing I do want to mention is that when you should replace your water heater is ideally before you need to, um, <laughs> uh, this, this happened to, that seems like a, some common sense, yeah. but that doesn't always, you know, if, if you're a homeowner who's think. sort of like out of sight, out of mind, um, yeah. you know, most water heaters come with warranties and as soon as that warranty has expired, you'll start to get leaks in, in the tank. Um, or have issues with it firing, you know, in a tankless version. Um, and if you don't replace your water heater preemptively, uh, the the way they fail uh, is is pretty <laughs> pretty crazy. Um, you know, with a tank water heater or a uh, tank water heater, um, the way they fail is usually uh, from like rust uh, and mineral buildup. And so you'll have a situation where like maybe you notice some water leaking from the bottom of it. And if you don't take care of it, then uh, eventually that bottom will rupture and you'll have however many gallons of water you have in your tank uh, in the area you've got your water heater. Not in the tank yeah. anymore. <laughs> um, and because yeah. uh, your your water supply is hooked up directly to your water heater, that water will continue to flow. Uh, and yeah, it's, as soon as it's empty, it's like, oh, it's empty. Yeah. Here, let's just fill it up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so do pay attention to that. Um, you know, look at, you should be able to find your manufacturer's warranty. Generally he, what a tank water heater should last 10 ish years. Uh, feels pretty good. The one we replaced had been in service for 20 years and I felt I sort of had a little bit of a ticking water bomb <laughs> in my basement. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, when you should replace your water heater is, you know, long enough that you've gotten all the utility you can out of your current water heater, but before your uh, a major water event <laughs> further damages your home. All right. Uh, well, Stephen, thanks so much for writing in. Uh, and that's it for this episode of Smart Energy. Special thanks to Andrew Correa for joining me and our guest, Sean Armstrong, for talking all about electrification. And of course, all of you for listening. Uh, to see the show notes, send feedback, and learn more about smart energy, visit omconnect.com slash smart energy. Stay safe, conserve some energy, and we'll see you next time.